you're not getting away with the second bit, my friend. <laughs> That's why we have multidisciplinary expertise. <laughs> so the answer to the first question that um, lanreotide has been shown in a phase three, three trial, so that robust trial that, um, that uh, Derek uh, spoke about, um, lanreotide was compared to placebo uh, in slow-growing tumors involving the pancreas and the mid-gut. And the results, although not published, were presented in a public international meeting called ESMO, it's the European uh, Society for Medical Oncology, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And the result was profoundly positive in favor of lanreotide being used. So the answer is that we suspected that there was an anti-proliferative or anti-cancer property to the lanreotide, just like the sandrostatin had previously been published in a different study, and this is being confirmed. Now, it will have to be, number one, published in a reputable peer-reviewed journal. That's for sure. So that's where all of our data goes into, so that other expert colleagues around the world will scrutinize the data very vigorously before it's accepted. And once that has been published then and accepted, it will go to be authorized by the European Regulatory Board or by the uh, FDA in America so that the drug will be approved for that use. So what do you do in the meantime? Well, we probably you know, prescribe it, and that's what we've been intending to do because we're allowed to do that. We're allowed to do that under certain circumstances. In some countries, it's not allowed. So, um, and my oncology friends might want to make a comment on that as well. So I think that it's pr we're probably just there now, and it is, it is useful for that. And Donald can correct me on this, but there is some, sandostatin can cause some disequilibrium with glucose control. But over a long period of time, it's usually not a problem. It's usually when you start sandostatin or lanreotide at the outset. Uh, it's long-term effects and glucose disequilibrium is really not that problematic. And you have to also bear in mind that patients who have got a long-term illness have every right to go on to that of diabetes and other types of illnesses as well. So that would be sort of my answer to that. Donald, with you any? So just to comment on the oncology aspect, so Dermot alluded to it, there was a study that looked at a, a sister drug, somatostatin LAR, for non-pancreatic ones that we knew about from, from a while ago now, that said not only does it control the carcinoid syndrome, the flushing, the symptoms, but it also has an anti-proliferative effect, so it reduces the growth of the cancer. Um, this study, called the, the Clarinet study, has now shown it for pancreatic as well. But one of the areas of scrutiny is we know they have anti-proliferative effects, but when do we use it? So some people will advocate, yes, this is a, an indication to use it for every single patient right now. But others will say, well, as this drug has benefit, can we leave it to later on? Because many of these cancers grow slowly. So while we definitely have evidence that this group of drugs are active for pretty much all neuroendocrine tumors, the question is where should they be used and what sequence with many of the other active drugs that Dermot has talked about. And some of you know, the, the sequence of how we use that is going to have to be worked out over the years to come. If I could just say something briefly, Dermot mentioned about access to drugs. So I, I'm not a, a HSE plant or anything, and, you know, the HSE gets bad press, but if I could just say the access to drugs in Ireland is second to none in the world. I've worked in the US, many colleagues here have worked in the UK. It's very, very tough to get access to the latest treatment in some countries in Europe. Our closest country, the UK, in fact, has the NICE guidelines, which, you know, have their pluses, but frequently access to expensive drugs is very, very restricted, and in the US also. So in Ireland, we're very lucky in that we invariably get very early access to expensive treatments. And also, if I could say about the uh, Treatment Overseas Fund, I don't know if they have a representative here. They certainly did at our meeting this morning. My personal experience has been that they're a, a very efficient organization who, if there is an appropriate specialist referring you for treatment overseas, they will fund it in a very speedy manner. And I've personally been involved in a lady who got approved and treated within five days because there was a cancellation overseas. So I think, you know, we, we're constantly hear bad press about our healthcare service, and obviously it's got its problems, I don't deny that. But access to drugs, both in Ireland and access to treatment overseas, in my experience here, which has been three and a half years, has been excellent and second to none. I think that's very important to, to note.